once again, Christian greetings to all our valued listeners and viewers throughout the whole world, even more particularly to all Shepherds Rod believers, and most especially to our beloved brothers and sisters in the United States of America. A special greetings to our brethren in Colorado, our brethren in Georgia, in Kansas, in Fiji Island, in Texas, in Mexico, Spain, in Africa, especially to our brethren in Kenya, and also in Pakistan, and to the United Kingdom, and to our brethren in Australia, and to the rest of the 144,000 living saints scattered abroad. Greetings. May the good Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. This is our episode number 24 on the subject, the chronological order of events, especially dedicated to our Beloved brethren, brother Steve, sister Corinne, and to the rest of the brethren who are listening and viewing this program, may the good Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. Now, I would like to uh, read this statement, um, number 74, or Review and Herald, March 22, 1887. It says, in the typical service When the work of atonement was performed by the high priest in the most holy place of the earthly sanctuary, the people were required to afflict their souls before God and confess their sins that they might be atoned for and blotted out. Will any less be required of us in this antitypical day of atonement when Christ in the sanctuary above is pleading in behalf of his people and the final irrevocable decision is to be pronounced upon every case. And here on uh, Review and Herald, May 18, 1905, it says, In this our day of confession, this last great day of atonement, I would like to read again, In this our day of confession, this last great day of atonement, before the books shall be opened, and every man shall be judged by the things written in the books, are we considering how we shall stand in the judgment in that day when every deed is to be tried and every act is to be brought into review before the heavenly universe? Let us not make play work of our religious life. Is it not time that we believe that Christ died on Calvary, that he might forgive our sins and pardon our transgressions? Now, let us read again, brothers and sisters, the that statement, let me see, concerning the last proclamation of the third angel's message, it is summed up with the seventh angel. Although we read that uh, several times, but let us read again. It says, it is written by, I think, by Wagoner. That is, if we can't gather any idea of what the watchman means, the angel of chapter 10 is the seventh angel. His message is the sum total of the three messages. And the last message of the seventh angel is the third angel's message. The last part of this last message is the promulgation of the doctrine of life and death. So, Advent Review, Sabbath Herald, on page 15. So, one of the most important message of that seventh angel in Revelation chapter 10 verse 5 to 7 is the final proclamation of the third angel's message. Remember on the great controversy on page 449 it says the most fearful threatening ever addressed to mortals is contained in the third angel's message. That must be a terrible sin which calls down the wrath of God and mingled with mercy. Men are not to be left in darkness concerning this important matter. The warning against this sin is to be given to the world before the visitation of God's judgments that all may know why they are to be inflicted and have opportunity to escape them. So, one of the main purpose why this message must be proclaimed to give to each individual the opportunity to escape such oncoming 
um, destruction. Now, I would like to read um, some statements here uh, written by Alonzo Jones. I would like to read first this, this statement in uh, number 79. It says, The rejection of the truth of God leaves men the captives of Satan and the subjects of his deception. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 to 12. This statement is in perfect harmony with the statement in 1 TG, the same verse that had been commented. Here in 1 TG number 50, pages 24 and page 25. The quotation is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 to verse 12. Now, I would like to read 1 TG 50, page 25. We see that if we do not fall in love with the truth, I will no longer elaborate more, brothers and sisters, but to declare that the truth mentioned here is the present truth. It says, we see that if we do not fall in love with the truth, deception is inevitable. No, none are deceived by coming in contact with error, for we are in contact with it anyway from the time we are born to the time we die. But everyone who does not love the truth is sure to be deceived, regardless what he may do to avoid it. And those who are satisfied with the truth of yesterday, who are not looking for fresh truth for today from the throne of God, not looking for meat in due season, such ones will find themselves in as terrible a predicament as did the Jews. Is spewed out. So the truth mentioned here is meat in due season, the present truth. 1 TG 50, page 25. That those who do not fall in love with the present truth, deception is inevitable. And it says, regardless how he may do to avoid it. In that reading, we can easily understand that the only way that we could be able to escape such deception and to escape such oncoming destruction is to love and to embrace and to accept the present truth. Now let's go back to our reading. It says here, The rejection of the truth of God leaves men the captives of Satan and the subjects of his deception. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 to 12. The greater the light, which men reject, the greater the power of deception and of darkness, which will come upon them. The Advent message has been given in our own land, and by the mass rejected, and no greater, and indeed no other light can ever be given to those who have turned away from that. The third angel gives us warning of the danger which is now before us, the warning precedes the danger that we, by seasonable admonition, may make our escape. So, that is very logical. The warning must be proclaimed before the oncoming danger. It must precede the danger. And it says, the warning which is before us. Now, let me read to you this reading. And... Um, um, number 75, and I think it is taken from uh, Lumalinda Messages, page 33. Lumalinda Messages, page 33. But to minimize time, I would like to read the last paragraph. It says, As the third angel's message arose in the world, as the third angel's message arose in the world, which is to reveal the law of God to the church in its fullness and power, the prophetic gift was also immediately restored. This gift has acted a very prominent part in the development and carrying forward of this message. So this reading plainly indicating that the third angel's message can never swell into a loud cry, not until the prophetic gift must be immediately restored. Now, as far as the shepherd's rod is thus concerned, let us read again, general conference is special. So, let's read. The general conference is special on page 39 and page 40. In fact, the three angels' messages 
are applicable to the judgment for the dead only indirectly. For the judgment for the living is the all-important event. That is, the angel is not sent particularly to explain what the judgment does to the dead, but what it is to do to the living. Then it says, so we see that the more we consider the subject, the more obvious becomes the truth that the third angel's message in its final phase is the judgment for the living, the harvest. Plainly then, the work of Elijah is to give light on the judgment for the living. The general conference is special. Pages 39 and page 40. Now we already read in the Lumalinda messages, page 33, that before the third angel's message will swell into a loud cry. One of the prominent event is that the prophetic gift must be immediately restored. And since in the general conference special, page 39 and page 40, that prophetic gift is definitely pointing to antitypical Elijah the Tisbite. According to general conference special page 39 and page 40 and he will be the one to explain the judgment for the living the final phase of the third angel's message now i would like to read this reading it says here and it is concerning the experience of joshua the son of um, joseph so i would like to read this reading uh, number 83, and I think it is Signs of the Times, June to 1890. Signs of the Times, June to 1890. It says, During the time of trouble, the position of God's people will be similar to the position of Joshua. They will not be ignorant of the work going on in heaven in their behalf. Who are they? That they will not be ignorant. It must be pointing to the living saints. They are the men wandered at. In 1 TG, I would like to read verse 1 TG number 8 on page page 24. And taken from Zechariah uh, chapter, I think, chapter 3, verse 8. It says, Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that set before thee. For they are men wandered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Now, let's read the statement given here. 1 TG number 8, page 24. Not only Joshua, but also those who sit before him, the congregation, are admonished to hear this charge. And what kind of men are they? Men wandered at. This symbolism shows that at the fulfillment of this prophecy, the angel of the church of the Laodiceans is no longer in charge of the Lord's house and that God's people are to be made up wholly of men wandered at. Now, do not forget this uh, statement, brothers and sisters, saying that at the fulfillment of this prophecy on Zechariah chapter 3 verse 8, at that time, the angel of the church of the Laodiceans is no longer in charge of the Lord's house, meaning they were already discharged because they were no longer in charge of the Lord's house. When? At the fulfillment of this prophecy, Zechariah 3 verse 8. At that time, the angel of the Laodiceans are no longer in charge of the Lord's house. Now, remember in answerer number 1, pages 32 and 33. Answerer number 1, pages 32 and page 33, it says, But later, to the Laodicean leadership, the angel, he makes an even more drastic decree and unconditional and equivocal, sharp and final a statement that he will spew them out, thus bringing the Laodicean church government to an abrupt and cataclysmic climax. 
at this very time, then the church is to undergo a thorough house cleaning, a change of administration and organization, even as anciently the kingdom was rent from Saul and given to David. 1 Samuel 15, 28. And then it says, And just as David, the eighth son of Jesse, was not chosen until the succession of his seven brothers had one by one passed in review so the house of David. Zechariah 12, verse 8. Testimonies, volume 5, page 81. The church freed from the thieves the eight church in the New Testament succession was not to come into being until the succession of seven had passed one by one. Answer number one, page 32 and 33. Of course, that statement is closely connected with our reading in Zechariah 3 verse 8, by which the shepherd said, definitely told us that at the fulfillment of this prophecy, Zechariah 3 verse 8, the angel of the Laodicean is no longer in charge of the Lord's house, plainly indicating that at that time, they were already discharged by God. Now let us continue reading. Proceed to the next paragraph. It says here, obviously then, as a result of this revival and reformation within the Laodicean church, another church emerges of which Joshua is in charge, not the angel of Laodicea. In it, there are to be neither theirs, Matthew 13 verse 30, bad fish, Matthew 13 verse 47, 48, or goats, Matthew 25 verse 32. The Laodicean, the seventh, is the last that is commingled with hypocrites, saints, and sinners. There are uh, seven churches by which the tares and the wheat are commingled. And the Laodicean is the last. So the eight churches in the New Testament succession will exist at the time, brothers and sisters, when God declared that there will be no more tares, there will be no more bad fish, both in the heavenly sanctuary and on the earthly sanctuary. Now, I would like to uh, read first 1 TG number 8 on page 26. 1 TG number 8, page 26. It says, so, Zechariah 6, verse 14. Let's go first to the Bible. So, Zechariah chapter 6, verse 14. Let us read uh, page 26. And the crown shall be to Helem, and to Tobijah, and to Jediah, and to Hen, the son of Sepaniah, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. Verse 14 reveals that Joshua is to pass the crowns on to his helpers. So the name mentioned here, Helem, Tobijah, Jediah, and Hen, represent the helpers of antitypical Joshua. Now, this is not Joshua, the son of Nun, but Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. Now, let us read again. It says, verse 14 reveals that Joshua is to pass the crowns on to his helpers, whom the Lord himself names. So, by naming Helem, Tobijah, Jediah, and Hen, figuratively saying that it is God who appointed them. And because God appointed them to be helpers of Joshua, Joshua was commanded by God to pass the crowns on to his helpers. He says, this is to be a memorial, an everlasting reminder in the temple of the Lord. What can all this mean? Just this, Joshua is heaven's appointed judge, ruler. He himself is crowned as such. And in response to the Lord's own command, Joshua crowns, authorizes his helpers, whom the Lord himself names. Or in other words, Joshua is well instructed. If you will read in page 27, it says, 1 TG number 8, page 27, Joshua is well instructed that the burden and the ingenuity for 
building this spiritual temple belongs to him whose name is the branch. He is to grow out of his place. To him be the glory. He alone is to be exalted. He is to build the temple of the Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, the, the voice of inspiration made it so plain that the temple of the Lord mentioned in Zechariah chapter 6 is a spiritual temple. And Joshua is well instructed that the burden and the ingenuity of the building of that spiritual temple is belong only to him whose name is the branch. Now, let us go back to 1TG number 8 on uh, page 24. It says, Who is to bring this revival and reformation? This great change. I would like to uh, read first uh, the statement on 1SR on page, let me see, 1SR on page 99. It says, the blood being applied on the doorpost. 1 SR page 99. The blood being applied on the doorpost is to signify that the seal or mark by which the 144,000 are to be sealed is to be visible. And then it says, The doorpost and the forehead both have the same significance. We do not mean to say that it is a certain visible brand or mark on the foreheads. But a seal of character, principle or rule, the standard being the word of God. Thus they applied the blood on the doorpost and their brethren in the church could be conscious of a change. I would like to um, emphasize that statement that their brethren in the church could be conscious of a change. Now let's go back again to this great change. It says 1 TG number 8, page 24. Who is to bring this revival and reformation? This great change. I think I will no longer elaborate the spiritual temple mentioned in 1 TG number 8, page 27. is pointing to the predicted final effort of that great revival and reformation. We need to study it closely, brothers and sisters, so that none of us should miss I would like to read that reading in 1 TG number 41, page 29. But I would like to begin on page 28. It is Isaiah 61, verse 10. So that is Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, hoping that this testimony, we are among these great people. So, this is the testimony of God's people. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments. And as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Then it says in page 29, 1TG 41, 29. It says, This chapter of Isaiah the prophet is indeed to bring revival and reformation such as has never taken place since the beginning of sin. God forbid that any one of us should miss the experience and the blessings that come through this revival and reformation. 1 TG 41 page 29. So the statement, God forbid that any one of us should miss that great experience happen only once in a lifetime that we will be among that people. The, the voice of inspiration um, plainly declared that it is impossible to give any idea of the experience of God's people at that time, according to volume 9, page 16. But we are conscious of that coming great change. And we address this message to all Shepherd's Rod believers, not to those who are so proud and boastful. In, in 1 TG number 41, it says, pages 24 and 25, Moreover, he was anointed to preach to the meek, to those who are not self-sufficient, 
not high-minded, but humble and teachable. The other class could not be thought. 1 TG 41 pages 24 and 25. And this message is only addressed to them who are humble and teachable, not to those who are self-sufficient and high-minded. This message will not benefit them. Now, I would like to read again the statement in 1 TG number 8. Page 24, it says, Who is to bring this revival and reformation, this great change? The answer is the branch. And according to Isaiah 11, verse 1 to 5, the branch is the Lord, the son of David. The same with the statement in 12 Symbolico, number 6 and 7, on page 15. It says, We know the branch to be Christ. 12 symbolic code number 6 and 7, page 15. We know the branch to be Christ. A branch is a part of a tree. And in this instance, the tree represents the kingdom of David, which is to come from the stem of Jesse. In that day, the branch shall be beautiful and glorious. And through the beauty and glory of the branch, which is Jesus Christ, the whole kingdom is also to be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. But the quotation is Isaiah 4 verse 2. Isaiah chapter 4 verse 2. Now, let us now connect uh, one subject to the other, brothers and sisters, in this study. Now, I would like to uh, read again the statement on um, signs of the times. June 2, 1890, paragraph 4. The one we read. During the time of trouble, it is in number 83 in our file. During the time of trouble, the position of God's people will be similar to the position of Joshua. And one of the prominent events is that everybody is accusing Joshua. But it was predicted beforehand. Now, let us read uh, Testimonies for the Church, uh, Volume 5, on page uh, 471. Uh, volume 5, page 471 and 472. It says, The fact that the acknowledged people of God are represented as standing before the Lord in filthy garments should lead to humility and deep searching of heart on the part of all who profess his name. Those who are indeed purifying their souls by obeying the truth will have a most humble opinion of themselves. The more closely they view the spotless character of Christ, the stronger will be their desire to be conformed to his image, and the less will they see of purity or holiness in themselves. But while we should realize our sinful condition, we are to rely upon Christ as our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. We cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Christ alone can make an effectual flee in our behalf. He is able to silence the accuser with arguments founded not upon our merits, but on his own, on the merits of Jesus Christ. So, that is very plain, brothers and sisters. And it was predicted beforehand that um, Joshua and those people who sit before Joshua, they will be accused by Satan. Now, let's go back again to the reading in Signs of the Times, uh, June 2, 1890, paragraph 4. It says, During the time of trouble, the positions of God's people will be similar to the position of Joshua. And then it says, they will not be ignorant of the work going on in heaven in their behalf. Who are these people? Predicted beforehand by which Joshua is in charge. By which at the fulfillment of that prophecy, according to 1 TG number 8, page 24, the angel of Laodicea are no longer in charge of the Lord's house, but rather Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. They are the people by which they are not ignorant of the work going on in heaven 
in their behalf. So that statement, brethren, plainly indicating that they have a complete knowledge concerning the proceedings that occurred in the heavenly sanctuary. Now let us read. Uh, let's continue reading. It says, The judgment of the dead has been going on, and soon the judgment will begin upon the living, and every case will be decided. It will be known whose names are retained upon the book of life, and whose are blotted out, brothers and sisters. So that is very plain in this reading. It will be known whose names are retained upon the book of life and whose names are blotted out. Now, let us go back to that reading, the great change. What is the great change? Revival and reformation. Who will bring that revival and reformation? Joshua is well instructed that the only one who can bring that revival and reformation is the branch. And that branch is Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, that revival and reformation can never be started not until Jesus Christ will visit the earth because he will be the one to bring that revival and reformation, which is the great change. Now, let's read 1SR Packet Edition, page 66. Uh, 1SR Packet Edition on page 66. It says here, And now, the reader, realizing that the time for a real feast of spiritual food, meat in due season, is actually here, you are, of course, lead to inquire what brought it, what made the great change. 1SR Packet Edition, page 66. Now, I would like to read again. And now, dear reader, realizing that the time for a real feast of spiritual food, meat in due season, is actually here. You are, of course, lead to inquire what brought it, what made the great change. Now, I know that it can be applied in the days of Bitty Hotter, but if you will study closely the prophecy, it is even more directly applied in the last days. In the judgment for the living. And Betty Hotter died in the judgment of the dead. Now, let us um, focus our attention, brothers and sisters, concerning that statement. What made this great change? I would like to read track number one. Here in track number one, page 39, it says, Following the completion of the slaughter and just preceding the scattering of the coals of fire over the city, the cherubim stood on the right side of the house and the cloud filled the inner court. Ezekiel 10 verse 2 and 3. And then it says, Later, they lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight, says the prophet. Ezekiel 10 verse 19. Then subsequently, he saw them again left up their wings, Ezekiel 11 verse 22 to 23, showing that though they had departed after the separation took place, Ezekiel 10 verse 3 and 19, they had later returned and were now departing for the second time. So in this reading, we can easily discern that the, the cherubims visited the earth twice because they departed twice. Now let us read... Um, Track number 1, page 12 and 13. Uh, track number 1, pages 12 and 13. It says, In the clear light of these facts, chapter 9 is seen to hold the climactic scene of the vision, describing the awful work which the Lord is to do when with the cherubim he visits the earth. It shows the first some consequences to those who reject its message, its blessings means the kingdom lost. Tragic, prideful experience, it shall be the fate of all who refuse now to awake and to know about it, but who choose rather to remain in ignorance of his truth and of the object of the Lord's coming in his throne. As the prophet was looking toward the north, he saw a great cloud coming like a whirlwind to earth, watching with intense interest. It's drawing nearer and nearer. Finally, he saw the living creatures, 
the wills and the rest, the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Where upon I fell, he says, upon my face, and I heard a voice of the one that spake unmistakably the Lord himself come to give a message to Ezekiel. Track number one, page 12 and 13. So, the absolute answer, what made this great change? To have that a real feast of spiritual food every day. The absolute answer is that because Jesus Christ came, visits the earth. What is the purpose? To give message to Ezekiel. And after Jesus Christ completely give the message to Ezekiel, in that mission, returns to heaven. I would like to read track number one, page 10. It says, as the chariots mounting up from the earth shows that in this particular throne, God visits the earth and then when his mission is accomplished, returns to heaven. So in that first visitation of Jesus Christ, what is his mission? The only mission is to give message to Ezekiel. And after all the messages had been completely given to Ezekiel, returns to heaven, returns to the heavenly sanctuary. And according to track number 1, page 39 and 40, let us read. It says, As the words which Ezekiel was to speak to his people were found in the book which he ate, the book can be none other than the Bible, from which comes the message culminating in joy, mourning, and woe. And lo, a rule of a book was therein, and he spread it before me. And it was written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Ezekiel 2 verse 9 and 10. Thy right in visaging the slaughter in Ezekiel 9. And the words pronounced in the master's parables. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him. And in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, there shall be weeping and gnashing of it. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him head and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of it. Matthew 24, verse 50 and 51, and Matthew 22, Verse 13. So what is the message that was given by God to Ezekiel? The whole Bible. The whole Bible, brothers and sisters. And that is pertaining to the plan of redemption. So let us read again 1 TG number 10, page 18. It says, The Bible contains the complete plan of salvation for all humanity. So the Bible contains the complete plan of salvation for all humanity. Now, brothers and sisters, let us read again this statement here. And let's read by A.G. Wagoner. Let us read again. The plain facts of the gospel are always the same and must never be lost sight of. It must also be remembered that the whole Bible is given for the purpose of revealing God to men and that this is done only through the cross. So that wherever we read, we may be sure that there is something that concerns the great work of salvation. So that is pointing to the great work of salvation. But the plan of redemption is from cross, from the death of Christ, from the resurrection of Christ to his mediatorial work in the heavenly sanctuary and that is the message of the third angel so let us read again the statement it says here on um, the great controversy page 489 it says the intercession of christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross by his death he began that work which after his resurrection, after his resurrection, he ascended to complete in heaven. It started from the cross and it will be completed 
to Christ's mediatorial work in the heavenly sanctuary. In the great controversy, page 435, it says, Those who had accepted the light concerning the mediation of Christ and the perpetuity of the law of God found that these were the truths presented in Revelation chapter 14. The messages of this chapter constitute a threefold warning which is to prepare the inhabitants of the earth for the Lord's second coming. But we explained it several times that the second coming mentioned here is the second invisible coming of Jesus Christ. Although it can also be applied to the second visible coming of Jesus Christ. But it is even more important to observe the second invisible coming of Jesus Christ by which in that coming he shall build the temple of the Lord. The spiritual temple represented by the stone cut out without hands. Now, I would like to um, connect this reading and to us are 100 um, I would like to read to us our page 172. It says, The song was sung in heaven by heavenly beings, before the throne and before the beasts and the elders. Therefore, it is evident that the judgment was in progress. For their explanation to follow, note that the 144,000 did not sing, but they only could learn the song as it was sung in heaven. That is, they alone understood the heavenly truth in that particular time and their position in connection with the message they must bear. But the question is that, why is it that the Bible called it the Song of Moses? In Revelation chapter 15, on verse 3, it says, And they sing the Song of Moses, the servant of God, and the Song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Let us read verse 2. Uh, Revelation 15, verse 2, and then verse 3. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And then that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the hearts of God. We know the occurrence is in heaven because... Um, the only one that they have the hearts of God, that is the poor beast and the 24 elders. But it is only a representation because they were represent representatives. But we need to study closely why is it that it is called the Song of Moses, brothers and sisters. The Bible made it so plain that such song is called the Song of Moses. I would like to read to you this passage. Let's read. It says here, um, this reading, um, I think it is written by Alonso Jones, by which the, the voice of inspiration says that um, no one could be able to learn that song. It says here, number 48, The time has come to sing the song of Moses. Shall we sing it? Let's read again. It says, The time has come to sing the song of Moses. Shall we sing it? But we shall not sing it in Egypt, you cannot sing it if you are in Egypt because they could not sing it until they were delivered out of Egypt. So that is very plain, brothers and sisters. The Bible, the reason that it says it is the song of Moses to remind us that that song never been sung by God's people, not until they were delivered from Egyptian bondage. And as long as we will still be in the Egyptian bondage, there is no possibility that we could be able to learn that song and we could never be able to sing that song. Because that song can be learned only and can be sing only until God's people will be delivered from the Egyptian bondage. Now, let's um, go back to, to SR. Here in 2SR page 170, 171, it says, uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. And I do, I do a lamb, 
stood on the Mount Zion and with him an hundred forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads. He says, the lamb denotes Christ signifying the position he occupies before the close of provision while yet interceding for his people. Therefore, the specific number of saints stand with him on earth while he is yet in the most holy place. Mount Zion in all Jerusalem was an ancient spot of that city and the place of the royal residence of David and his successors. Therefore, from that viewpoint, we must present the meaning of the lamp that stood on the Mount Zion. We are told by the following scriptures, the Lord hath made a promise that the house of David, Mount Zion. What is Mount Zion? The house of David. Now, brothers and sisters, before continuing this statement, Let's go back again to timely greetings. First in 1 TG number 8 on page 26, it says, What can all this mean? Just this, Joshua is heaven's appointed judge ruler. He himself is crowned as such. And in response to the Lord's own command, Joshua crowns or meaning authorizes his helpers whom the Lord himself names. In other words, as members of the house of David, Joshua authorizes them to engage in the work. Now, this reading, brothers and sisters, is definitely telling you and I that the genuine revival and reformation in the last days, in our days, it is led by Joshua, the high priest. And it is Joshua who authorizes them to engage in the work. So those who engage in the work at this present time, the most important question is that who authorizes them to engage in the work of the Lord? I fully believe that it is the same with the statement on 1 TG number 2 on page 20. It says, Only those who gain entrance through the door and to whom the porter, the one through whom the spirit of prophecy is manifested. He did not say, the one through whom the spirit of prophecy was manifested, but rather inscribed in present passive tense. The one through whom the spirit of prophecy is manifested opens are the authorized shepherds whose voices God's sheep hear. All such shepherds call the sheep by name. They are well acquainted with their flocks because they are intensely interested in them and they carefully lead them in and out. And in this study, the porter mentioned here must be Joshua, by which the Spirit of Christ is manifested unto him. And Joshua authorizes them to engage in the work so Joshua is responsible to the Lord, but his helpers are responsible to Joshua. Here is seen an organization having a leader and under leader, the Lord and Joshua. This is the only organization predicted beforehand that will follow the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let us read again, 1 TG number 8, page 24. Obviously then, as a result, of this revival and reformation within the Laodicean church, no one would deny the absolute fact that such revival and reformation that had been launched within the Laodicean church is the revival and reformation that was launched from 1930 to 1955 and it was continued by the faithful followers of B.T. Hotep after B.T. Hotep died. But there is a prediction that that revival and reformation within the Laodicean church, the result, the outcome, the final outcome of that revival and reformation will be at the time when this a church, the predicted church, the last church in the New Testament succession emerges by which it is no longer the angel of Laodicea that is in charge of that church which is the house of the Lord but rather Joshua 
ang titipical Joshua, the son of Josedek. And according to the reading, that at that time, the angel of the church in the Laodiceans are already discharged by God. So that is very plain, brothers and sisters. And it is called the house of David. 1 TG number 8, page 26. So in this study, brothers and sisters, why is it that in this uh, study, the the prophetic gift is called antitypical Joshua? Because it points out to the work of Joshua, according to our reading, it is pertaining to the information Joshua is well instructed concerning Christ's mediatorial work in the heavenly sanctuary. It is easy to claim, but it is hard to prove. In different angles, God employed every possible means that the last and the final movement can be clearly discerned, easily recognized by those people who are honest and sincere, who are humble and teachable. Now, I would like to uh, go back to 2SR 171 and 172. So let us read again. It says, We are told by the following scriptures, the Lord had made a promise that the house of David, that is symbolically called Mount Zion. So to be a part of the house of David is signifying that we are standing symbolically on Mount Zion. Now let us read again the statement. It says, We are told by the following scriptures, the Lord had made a promise that the house of David, meaning Mount Zion, was a light to him and to his sons forever. Howbeit the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David. And he says, And as the promise to give a light to him and to his sons forever. Second Chronicles 21 verse 7. The promise was not to Mount Zion, house of David in ancient Jerusalem, for the existence of the Jewish nation was conditional. So the voice of inspiration, brothers and sisters, is plainly telling you and I that when this house of David will be in existence, it is no longer conditional. Remember the statement in 1 TG number 18 on page 14. It says, two things now stand out clearly in these verses. It is concerning Zechariah 13 verse 1 and 2. Zechariah 13 verses 1 and 2. Two things now stand out clearly in these verses. That the house of David must come into existence before the cleansing fountain is opened. So that is very plain that the house of David must come into existence first before the cleansing fountain is opened. That is very logical because the intention of the opening of the fountain is to the whole house of David. Zechariah 13 verse 1 and 2. Now, when would be the cleansing fountain is to be opened? We know that that cleansing fountain, according to 2SR 290, it says, In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Zechariah 13 verse 1. Note that this fountain is able to wash away two things, first sin and second uncleanness. So let us distinctly separate the opening of the fountain by which the purpose of that opening of that fountain is to cleanse God's people from sin and the opening of that fountain to cleanse God's people from uncleanness. For sure, brothers and sisters, before God's people reached that literal premillennial kingdom, their sins were already blotted out. They were already cleansed their sins. So the cleansing fountain must be opened to cleanse the sin of God's people that is prior to the kingdom. And then that cleansing fountain will be opened into the kingdom to cleanse their uncleanness. Now, let us read another statement in Timely Greetings in 2TG44, page 48. 2TG44, page 48. It says, The revival and reformation herein presented, mourning and heart searching, caused by appreciativeness of God's great mercy and goodness, 
shall be in the day the governors of Judah say, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength. In the day the Lord makes even the most feeble among them as David and the house of David as God as the angel of the Lord. When this thorough reformation takes place, then the cleansing fountain shall be opened to the whole house of David. 2 TG 44 page 48, it says, When this thorough reformation takes place, then the cleansing fountain shall be opened to the whole house of David. Now let us focus our attention to that reading, thorough reformation. When this thorough reformation takes place, then the cleansing fountain shall be opened to the whole house of David. If we will be saying whole house of David, I would like to say to the entire 144,000 living saints. I would like to read. 3 Symbolic Code number 2, page 3. 3 Symbolic Code number 2, page 3. And now, in the time of the ingathering of modern Israel, the 144,000 who are to make up the antitypical house of David. 3 Symbolic Code number 2, page 3. Who are they to make up? The antitypical house of David indicated as the whole house of David, the 144,000 living saints, you and I. Let me read to you this reading, I think in 1 TG, number 18, page 21. It says, we should now be able to see how the gospel work is to be finished. 1 TG, number 18, page 21. We should now be able to see how the gospel work is to be finished and that the idea which we have had about it is merely a human fabrication. It is now clearly seen how sinners are made saints. It is now clearly seen how sinners are made saints when and how God's fountain cleanses all penitent sinners making us as white as snow if we let him it says, God's fountain cleanses all penitent sinners. Another term of penitent sinners is repentant sinners. Hoping that we are among that repentant sinners or penitent sinners. I would like to read this reading in 1 TG 28, 17. It says, Our God is wonderful indeed. He retains not his anger. He delights in mercy. He remembers not the sins of the penitent. He remembers not the sins of the penitent. He cast them away where they cannot be found anymore. In, in 1 TG 28, page 12, it says, the same with the statement we read in 1 TG number 18, right? On page 21, saying, when and how God's fountain cleanses all penitent sinners, making us as white as snow, if we let him. There are two questions mentioned here. When God's fountain will be open, and how God's fountain cleanses all penitent sinners. When and how. But it says that this fountain cleanses only to all penitent sinners. And then it says, making us as white as snow, if we let him. So it matters not what we were yesterday. The important thing is what are we to do today and what are we to be from this hour on. The same with the statement in 1 TG number 28 page 12 saying, Indeed, the important thing is not how good or how bad we are or have been, but how susceptible and submissive to present truth we are now while it unfolds. The real burden of our prayer should be that we catch a vision of the truth that makes free if accepted as the scroll and rules. Now, let us go back to, to SR 171. Now, let us read. It says, Now to Abraham and his seed will the promises made. He said not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ, the son of David. Galatians 3, verse 16. Now, ponder deeply, brothers and sisters, this wonderful prophecy. And then it says, Therefore, Mount Zion 
As in Revelation 14 verse 1, is the imminent royal spot in the heavenly Jerusalem. As David himself says, For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Psalms 122 verse 5. David looked forward to the time when the judgment in heaven would be set up in that day. There shall be a, in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Zechariah 13 verse 1. So Zechariah 13 verse 1 and Psalms 122 verse 5 and Galatians 3 verse 16 and Revelation 14 verse 1 is pointing to the same prophecy. Now let us Look at first Galatians 3 verse 16. Galatians 3 verse 16. Let's read the Bible. Galatians chapter 3 on verse 16. It says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, unto thy seed, which is Christ. Now let us read the statement given by inspiration. So it says here, written by Alonso Jones, saying that let us not put an S to the thing by which, let us read, um, written by Alonso Jones. It says, all the time God's oath was to give th that land to Abraham and to his seed. Do not put seeds upon it. When God has torn it off, do not put an S to that when God has torn it away. He said not unto seeds as of many, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ. There were many of them, that is true. Three million came out of Egypt, but these are not the ones that God was speaking of, of when he said to thee unto thy seed, which was as of one and of which is Christ. Do you see that? Do not let the multitude of Israel get into your mind when you read the words. To thee and to thy seed. And then it says, When God cuts off the S, we are not allowed to put in there at all. We must not put it there even in our thinking. Who was the seed? Christ. When he says, To thee and to thy seed, you and I must not read it in any other way than to thee and Christ will I give it. For an everlasting possession. We must not put any others than Christ there. Except through Christ. To thee and Christ will I give it. Now who is that son of Abraham. Represented by, by Christ. There is no other. Except Isaac. According to the Bible. Right. Now let us read brothers and sisters. The statement here. By Alonso Jones. General Conference Daily Bulletin. It says Isaac was the promised seed. Isaac was the promised seed. And just think, Isaac never was in Egypt. You remember that? There was a famine in Egypt and he started to go there. But the Lord said to him, do not go into Egypt. Abraham was in Egypt. Sarah was in Egypt. Israel was in Egypt. But Isaac never was in Egypt. He was the child of promise. Born of the Spirit from the beginning. Now brothers and sisters, what is the thought in these allegorical events? That only Isaac never been in Egypt. Now I would like to read first uh, 1SR. 1SR on page 115 and 116. So let's read the statement. We, we begin with the fourth verse and onward. We shall later take the first three and last two verses. Israel after the flesh was a type of Israel by the promise. As explained on pages 64 to 113, the experience of the children of Israel in Egypt was a photograph of our denomination. Thus their experience is being reproduced in every particular with these people. And if there are 430 years connected with Israel after the flesh, then the same period of time must be connected with the truth. The 430 year period by Abraham did not have to do only with ancient Israel, but with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as well. Now let us focus to Isaac. Isaac was never in Egypt. Now I would like to read one SR. Page 15. 1SR page 15. It says, 
In volume 3, page 369, we read, Isaac was a figure of the Son of God, was offered a sacrifice for the sins of the world. Again, we read in Desire of Ages, page 112, and in the in the ramp divinely provided in the place of Isaac, Abraham saw a symbol of him who was to die for the sins of men. Thus, Isaac and the ramp are symbols of Christ's submission, death, and sacrifice. But we focus our attention to the promise. The promise that was given by God to Abraham that that promise will never be fulfilled until that seed will come. And that seed is represented by Isaac. But we know it was not fulfilled in their lifetime. Isaac is only a representation of Jesus Christ. But the absolute fact is that it cannot be applied on the first advent of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ was in Egypt at that time. Now let us read the statement in Zazie. And we know that that is only the fulfillment of what had been predicted in in Hosea. So let's read. Let me see if we could find that statement. When Jesus Christ, let's read uh, General Conference Daily Bulletin. He says, Another thought as to spiritual Egypt. It is written of Jesus. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Why is that written about Jesus? Why did Jesus go into Egypt? Why was he taken into Egypt? He could have escaped the slaughter of the children that were slain in Bethlehem by going a short distance away from that place and would not have had to go nearly so far as to Egypt. All of the little children in Palestine were not slain when the decree of Herod went forth. It was only Bethlehem and its coast and its suburbs. Bethlehem was only six miles from Jerusalem and the children in Jerusalem were not slain. So the Lord could have escaped if he had been taken 10 or 12 miles away. And he says, then why was he taken into Egypt? Oh, that it might be fulfilled that was written, Out of Egypt have I called my son. And that is in Hosea. He was ourselves, yourself and myself. He was ourselves. And as God met his people in Egypt and led them out, so our Savior came to where we are and was as we are and was called out of Egypt, thus showing that whoever would be as he is must likewise come out of Egypt. He was the son of God and was called out of Egypt, thus showing that all who will be sons of God must also come out of Egypt. For it is written of all as of him, out of Egypt have I called my son. Are you a son of God? Out of Egypt have I called my son. But what we're studying in... Um, uh, what we focus our attention in this study is concerning that promise. That promise given by God to Abraham must be fulfilled to the church in the last days. To the church in the last generation of men. Why is it that it is represented by Isaac? To let us know that the last church in the New Testament succession, the eight church, that church is never been in Egypt. I would like to read. This reading, again in 1SR Packet Edition, on page 63, it says, Thus where ministry and lighty, hypocrite, martyr, and saint type in the very beginning of the human race. Isaac, the firstborn son, through promise, through the will of God, can only represent a class of ministers who are placed in that holy office through the promise, spiritual birthright, born again, divinely appointed. Ishmael to being Abraham's firstborn son, but not through legal marriage or promise, he circumstantially represents a class of carnal ministry who are led to that office not through spiritual birthright and a call from the Lord of the vineyard, but only through favorable opportunity. In this manner, dramatize the character of the self-willed Jewish rabbis, the Ishmaelites in antitype, who persecuted the apostles, the Isaacites in antitype. Then it says, Esau and Jacob being twins and the last of in this line of typology, they therefore foreshadow two classes of people living at the same time in the church period, subsequent to the one which Isaac represents, the last, the Laodicean. 
Isao being the firstborn play figures and Isao white ministry for as little as a mess of pottage for fit their position to a Jacobite lady. Now, here, brothers and sisters, the voice of inspiration says that Isaac represent the divinely appointed ministry. And they were called the Emmanuelites in track number 14. So in this study, we can easily discern that the last and the final movement cannot be in Egypt because Isaac was never been in Egypt. Now, I would like to read uh, track number 12. Track number 12 on page, uh, let me read that statement. There is B.T. Hotev says that it is superfluous to, uh, to say that um, page 41, track number 12, page 41, a beginning from page 40, the wilderness locate the scarlet colored beast domain. By contrast, a wilderness is the opposite of a vineyard. And since a vineyard is figurative of the home of God's people, Isaiah 5, the wilderness can only represent the home of the Gentiles. The beast being in the wilderness indicates that at the time it comes into existence, there is a vineyard. Then it says, obviously, it would be superfluous to designate the wilderness if the whole world is wilderness. This statement by B.T. Hotep is also the same, that obviously it would be superfluous to designate Egypt and sister, or to designate God's people out of Egypt if the whole world is Egypt. How could it be that it will say out of Egypt if the whole world is Egypt? So it is superfluous according to the shepherd's rod. Now let, let us state what the shepherd's rod teaches. Now let us read 1SR 157 and 158. Um, 1SR page 157 and 158. Quoting Exodus 15 verse 14 to 16. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone. Till thy people pass over, O Lord, till thy people pass over, which thou hast purchased. The land of Canaan represents the land into which the church at this present time came into existence, namely the United States of America. The name Palestina means lands of, land of strangers. The United States is composed of strangers, people from many nations and races. Jokes of Edom refers to the same class as those mentioned in Isaiah 63 verse 1. As previously explained, the name Moab means progeny or forefathers. Now here is another statement. And... Um, 1SR, page 76, it says, The land of Goshen. The beginning of this denomination was typified by Israel's entrance into Egypt. As previously explained, we shall now consider the truth of the land of Goshen. Joseph brought Israel into Egypt and gave them the part of the land to dwell in which was the best land in the country of Egypt. And there Joseph now rests them, their flocks, herds, and cattle, and all they had. So, the very place by which Joseph now rest them, brothers and sisters, all their flocks, herds, and cattle, is in the land of Goshen. The land of Goshen stands as a symbol of the United States of America, in which the church came into existence while our country is productive like the land of Goshen, the richest in the world, and a Protestant nation, it is the best for missionary work, for it is made up of all nations, and therefore like the land of Goshen, the most productive in Egypt, the world. But that is the time when Joseph was still alive. But when Joseph died, brothers and sisters, uh, the scene changes, right? According to the historical event. But that is not the main point of our study. If United States of America is antitypical Goshen, according to the shepherd's run. Yes, brothers and sisters, um, Abraham, Jacob, Sarah, all of them were in Egypt, but never Isaac. And God is being the author of the scriptures. When Isaac desired to go to Egypt, there is a divine command given to Isaac, do not go into Egypt. So that 
historical event, being typifying the last generation of men, the church represented by Isaac, brothers and sisters. Remember the Jacobites, they are lighty, the membership, but Isaac represent the ministry. The last ordained ministry is represented by Isaac. And who is Isaac? Jesus Christ. But it cannot be applied to the first advent of Jesus Christ. Because at that time, Jesus Christ was in Egypt. It must be pointing to the last days, to the last generation of men. That Jesus Christ represented by Isaac. That Isaac was never in Egypt, plainly indicating that the church, when Jesus Christ will visit, that church could not be in Egypt. The mere fact that Emmanuel is represented by Isaac, let us read track number 14. Track number 14 on page 35. Having been pre-existent with his father, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 and 2, and John chapter 1 verse 1 and 2, and then having been reborn in Bethlehem, Emmanuel manifestly represents the born again Christians, John 3 verse 3, whereas never having been pre-existent, Mahir Shalal Hasbas can only symbolize those not born again, that part of the church memberships which cannot be represented by Emmanuel. A parallel is found in the allegory of Ismail and Isaac typifying the born after the flesh and the born after the spirit, the non-Christian Jew and the Christian Jew. See Galatians 4 verse 22 to 31. Who is he represented by Emmanuel? It is Isaac. What does it mean by Emmanuel? God is with us. And that is pointing to that predicted event, brothers and sisters. According to 1 TG number 12. Let us read. Uh, 1 TG number 12, page 26. Sikariah's coming of the Lord, therefore, is the same as Michael standing to deliver all those whose names are written in the book. This was shown to the vision of Sister White. When Jesus Christ is pleading to God the Father, when God the Father is, is sitting on the great white throne, it says, Sikariah's coming of the Lord, therefore, is the same as Michael standing to deliver all those whose names are written in the book. Now, according to the shepherd's rod, if that standing of Michael, there are still names of the wicked, then Jesus Christ will be obliged to deliver the wicked together with the righteous. It says here in track number 3, on page uh, 50 and 51, as the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is a work of cleansing the books by blotting from them the names of both the backsliders and the tares, and as at the time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, the only ones who shall be delivered are those whose names are found written in the book. The cleansing of the books, therefore, obviously takes place before the resurrection and before the time of trouble such as never was. Thus the unfaithful dead will be left in their graves at the first resurrection and the unfaithful living will be left without deliverance from the coming trouble. But were their names allowed to remain in the books, then according to the records, either the wicked dead would be would have to be resurrected with the righteous and the living wicked delivered with the living righteous, or else both the righteous dead and the righteous living would have to be forsaken with them alternatives, both of which, of course, are impossible. Track number 3, page 50 and page 51. So, brothers and sisters, to repeat again, um, we can rest assured that according to the prophecy, the last and the final movement, the reason that it is represented by Isaac to inform all the constituents of the 144,000 that the last and the final movement that will be recognized by Jesus Christ as his movement must be the church represented by Isaac. And Isaac was never been in Egypt. Brothers and sisters, from Abraham, brothers and sisters, there are only two events by which that prophecy must be fulfilled. Isaac represents Jesus Christ, according to Galatians 3 verse 16. And in 2 SR 171, that predicted event must be to the second advent of Jesus Christ, 
by which Jesus Christ will visit the earth. But at that time, Jesus Christ will never, never go into Egypt. Because the life of Jesus Christ at that time is represented by Isaac. And Isaac was never been in Egypt. Just read the Bible. And then the spirit of prophecy. It tells the whole truth. So the statement in 1 SR 124, it says, uh, The picture tells the story and symbols do not lie. So, brothers and sisters, hoping that God would help us and would bless us. But we can rest assured to you that this message you can never heard to any movement located in the United States of America. Because in Revelation chapter 5, no man in heaven, nor in earth, nor under the earth could be able to explain, brothers and sisters, the judicial proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary except through the Spirit of Christ. He is the only one. And that event is represented by the life of Isaac, that Isaac was never been in Egypt. The promised seed, which is Jesus Christ, indicating that the church by which Jesus Christ will visit in Zechariah chapter 2, by which Jesus Christ will be in their midst, must be the church represented by Isaac, never been in Egypt. We will continue this subject, brothers and sisters, and hoping that the good Lord would bless us and would help us. Thank you very much for listening and viewing this program. Have a beautiful, wonderful evening.